Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, we're going to look at these first three words. It says, do not judge. And believe it or not, this message is going to help all of us today. Do not judge. You know, when I, I was studying this, I was, there's a lot that could be said about this. But we need to decide what it's not saying. Is this saying that we are never to judge or try to discern whether someone is living right or not? So if we see someone in active sin, oh, that's okay. God said don't judge, and so we're not going to judge. Is that what this is saying? No. You'll notice, and we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks, in this very same chapter, Jesus warns against false prophet, and he says, I want you to look at their fruit. Okay, see if they're in the faith or not. So if we are to look at this fruit, the fruit of the people, and see how they're following God and what's the fruit of what they're teaching. If we are supposed to examine that, what is that? We're judging, right? We are judging their fruit. So is there something wrong in what Jesus said? How can he at the beginning say, do not judge, and then at the end of the same chapter, talk about judging? Well, we must be missing something. This term judging is greater than what we think. What does it mean to judge? Practically, I'm going to give you a definition, and you're not going to find this in your Bible, but this is my understanding uh, from the Scripture and prayer and study, and you ask God and see if it makes sense to you. The judging that I believe that Jesus is talking about here is this, being reckless and quick to make judgments and assumptions about someone's salvation, about their character, or their walk with God. I'm going to stop. If you want to write this down, feel free to do this. I'm going to say it one more time, and I want you to think about this. The judging that Jesus is talking about here is being reckless and quick to make judgments and assumptions about someone's salvation, about their character, or about their walk with God. Let's make it even easier for you here today. I believe that the judging that Jesus is talking about is pre-judging someone. Or we put those words together, what do we get? Prejudice, right? When you look at someone, you see one piece of their life and you write in the rest. Aren't we great at that? We see one thing that someone does and we say, yeah, they must be terrible people, you know, at home. They're probably, you know, terrible with their kids and there's no good people. And all based on one simple thing that we see. That is prejudging someone. I believe that's what Jesus is talking about here. Also, not only just prejudging, it's overjudging as well. A good scripture for this is Matthew chapter 23 and verse 24. Jesus says, You blind guides, you strain at a gnat, but swallow a camel. Basically, he's saying, You judge the smallest of things. But you got these big, huge issues in your life. So Jesus is not saying that we're not supposed to see if someone's following after God or not. This is made in the context of others. When we look at the tiniest thing in someone else's life, but ignore the great sin in our own life. Also, it's going further than God wants us to. It's condemning. That that word judging has a connotation of condemning as well. Sometimes we have a tendency to not just judge someone, but we take it on our responsibility to actually enforce that judgment, right? We make them pay for 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 that. So where does this kind of judging lead if we do this? I believe that it starts divisions in the body of Christ fighting brothers and sisters. I believe gossip happens, tearing down each other, possibly even hate towards brothers and its lack of spiritual growth. I mean, let's talk for, uh, to be real just for a minute. How many of you have ever been part of a church fight? Now, don't raise your hand. <laughs> can, you, um, can you think about the silly things that we can fight over? The color of the carpet, the songs that we sing, whether 
we have shades or, or not shades. You know, there are so many things that are very uh, small. But what does the enemy love to do? He loves to cause problems. He lo- loves to cause division. Uh, think about it, uh, youth. You just been through an amazing time together. You know what the enemy would love to have happen in you guys? To start having a fight right between the two of you. So when you come into youth group, you don't talk to one another anymore. As, that is a quick way to squelch the move of God. Yeah. Wouldn't you think so? Uh, in the church, God is doing amazing things. What's a great way for the enemy to stop that? To get us fighting. To get us thinking about all the little small uh, annoyances or differences that we have. And to break us apart. That, I believe, is what Jesus is talking about when he says, do not judge. So that's where it leads. I believe the enemy delights when we do this. And I think it's important to remember that this kind of judging that Jesus is talking about is not God-led judgment. It's a self-serving judgment. I want you to think about that for a minute. It's not that God is saying, I want you to evaluate this person, see if they're in the faith or not, see what if what they're doing is right. It's more of motivation inside of us. Maybe a curiosity. Is this person right? Or maybe it's something else. But somehow the judging of this other individual serves us. So that brings the question, why do we judge? I, I think if we're honest, we have all been guilty of this kind of judging that Jesus is talking about. But why do we judge this way? Well, I think one of the reasons is, is to avoid our own sin. How many of you remember that old song? It's me, it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Hallelujah. I got a new verse. It's him, it's him, it's him, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Right? We, we do it. Sometimes we judge people because we don't want to deal with what's here. And so we focus on everybody else's sin. Because if we focus on their sin, we won't have enough problem, uh, time to worry about our sin. I think another th- reason why we judge is to level the playing field. Okay, let's just take... Uh, Matthew, you sit on the end of the row. You're just, just an easy pick for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> let's say that, that Matthew is just this really great, and you are a great Christian that loves God, and I'm not so great in my faith. And every time I get around Matthew, I kind of feel bad because he's just so good. And so I don't like that. So I look in Matthew's life to see if I can find anything that he does that's wrong. And I enjoy that. And I begin telling other people about that because if I can make Matthew look bad, then we're okay. We're on the same plane. He's bad, I'm bad, we're okay. So we, in judging, we try to level the playing field. Let's look at another one. It goes a step further. In judging, we try to boost our self-worth. This is not taking Matthew down to our level, and that's not good enough. Let's, let's push him down a little bit further, and then we really look good. You lousy bunch of sinners! Look, I'm good. Yeah. If we can pick apart different people, every time we pick them apart, they get lower in our eyes, maybe in the eyes of others, and then maybe we rise above the top. So in putting down others, it boosts our self-worth. And what I want you to, to do here is don't just listen to these words. I want you to ask yourself the question, is that why I do what I do? Have I been guilty of doing this? What motivates me to judge? Let's look at another. Sometimes we judge people to have control or power over someone else. This is someone that is nitpicking every single thing that someone does and putting them down. And it's like going up to this individual over and over again and said, you know, you need to do this. You need to do this. This area in your life is wrong. You need to do this. And you know what's happening in that, that process? That the person is getting beat down and they're having to come back to you. And it's a sense of power that you hold over someone else when you judge. Some people judge so that they can have control or power over someone else. 
And then some people, and you may be surprised by this, but some people judge and they do it because they misunderstand their calling. Some people feel called like it's their, their duty to judge other people. Let's talk about that misunderstanding of, of calling just for a minute. Our calling is to not make people like us. Have you ever thought about that before? When you judge people and you try to bring change in their life, who are you trying to make them more like? Are you, man, I just wish they could be more like Joel, you know? Life would be so much better if everybody was like me, right? Have we ever, I have to be careful about it when I counsel people, when I preach from this pulpit. My goal is not to make you more like me, but to make you more like Christ. You know why? I got flaws, right? If I make you like me, I throw in the package my flaws, right? The same way for us. We're going to show what that looks like in just a minute. There are personalities that are different, but not always wrong. So a lot of times we judge people on personalities. Let's take, for instance, there's four stereotypes that are out there. Uh, the lion, right? We talked about this before. We've got the, the lion and what's the opposite? The golden retriever. So the lion is this bold personality. And uh, the lion might be tempted to say to the golden retriever, man, get a backbone, Would you speak what you believe? Tell people how you feel? Come on, stop being timid. Get up there, be bold, okay? And you know what the golden retriever would say back to the lion? Do you see all the people you're hurting with your words? Be careful. Think about what you say before you trample someone underneath your feet. So who's wrong? Both of them have an element of truth. God has made them in that pattern. And there becomes a difficulty. If a lion tries to make everybody a lion, then they're going to have those same flaws that that same person does. Or how about this? Uh, the otter is the, the fun person, always wants to have a good time, and the, and the beaver is more structured. So what if the otter comes up to the beaver and says, man, you got to have the joy of the Lord. you got to live a little. Let loose. Come on. Let's have a good time serving God. And then the beaver says, man, we're in the very presence of God. God deserves deep respect. Okay, who's wrong? They both have an element of truth there. But if we try to make people like us, it's not always good. Personalities are different, but not always wrong. So our calling is not to make people like us. Our calling is to bring people closer to God. Instead of trying to form people in your image, you need to help get people to God so that they can talk to God. Just like we were doing today in time of worship, what's happening? We're communicating with God. Everyone is communicating with God, and God is speaking to us right where we are. And that's what we need to have happen. In our aim to help them become more like Christ, our words pale in comparison to our actions. We've got to live it out. In Titus chapter 2, verse 7, it says, In everything set an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed, because they have nothing bad to say about us. So if you're trying to judge people to make them more like you, let me tell you what's more effective. Live it out. Show people by your life how to live. Our calling also is not to take God's place. And this is what I was talking about in judgment. Sometimes we see something in someone else and we take it on ourselves to correct them and to make them better. And sometimes we miss it when we do that. You know why? Because God knows the right time an area to work on at that time. How many of you uh, came to Christ from a bad, a bad situation? Like you were, yeah. Imagine coming to God and the second that you walk inside that door, you're wearing the wrong clothes and uh, Craig grabs you to decide, hey, come in this room. I got a suit for you. Let's put on this suit. Okay, let's brush that hair a little bit. Okay, go ahead and come in. You're okay. Well, I see that you've been smoking. Let's, let's go ahead and detox you right out here. And uh, yeah, I, you're told a lie. We've got to work on that. Just imagine all the sin that you come in with if someone hit you with every wrong thing that you were doing at that moment. Could you handle it? It would be hard. 
I'm thankful that we serve a God that says, come just as you are. Okay? We come with our sin before God, and He, as our Father, shows us little by little those areas that we need to work on. He knows the right time, and He knows how to confront us with those things. Just imagine what it would be like to be the one that had to change everything immediately and the stress and the pressure that's on that. We need to be careful that we don't overstep our bounds. Now, that was all in three words. The rest won't be as long. (laughs) Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Jesus is talking to his ambassadors, his disciples, the crowd that was there that day, Sermon on the Mount. Do not judge or you too will be judged. How many of you watched the Olympics before? Seen ice skating? Man, I love ice skating. I mean, they're, they're going around, going backwards, and I'd try, but I'd fall. You know, how many of you have seen them, uh, like, high level of competition, and they're trying this quadruple, you know, turn, or this flip, and you know what happens? They fall. And then the next uh, girl that gets up, she falls. And what do you do uh, from the seat? Man, these are professionals and they're falling. This is the Olympics. Come on. Right? And we're sitting from our seat. And the question, obvious question is, can you even skate? You know? <laughs> if you can skate, can you, can you do a flip? Can you do one flip? The thing is, we from our remote think, wow. You know, that, they should have been able to do that. But we are looking at one small thing in the comparison to something we can't even get close to, right? Guys that watch football, ladies that watch football, raise your hand if you watch football. I know you're guilty of this. Your favorite guy is running the ball. He gets hit. What does he do? He drops it. Come on, can't you hold on to the ball? And the obvious question is, why aren't you there? I didn't see uh, you get drafted to that, right? You're not playing for the NFL. But it's, it's easier for us to judge someone else, even if, you know, we're not even close to them. It's easy for us to make judgments about them. Now, when it comes to the Christian faith, we can do similar things. We have major areas that we may not even be at the same place as someone else in their walk with Christ, but we sure are good at picking up the little stumbles, aren't we? And see that person that did that? And we, we point our fingers and we judge. And what Jesus says here is, do not judge or you too will be judged. If you are pinpointing all the little flaws in everyone else, guess what? Someone's going to pinpoint all the little flaws in you. It says in verse 2, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. So that means if you get out the, uh, the magnifying glass and you begin to look closely at every single individual and everything that they do from waking to going to sleep, that's exactly what's going to happen to you. They're going to look at you with that magnifying glass in the same way. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So if you find that flaw and you begin to talk to everybody about it, do you see what Peter did? Hey, yeah, Peter struggles with this sin and this sin. Hey, by the way, Peter, yeah, he struggles with that. Sorry, man. (laughs) If you go and do that, what's going to happen to you? Hey, Joel, he struggles with that. Did Did you hear that? Joel struggles with this. It's going to be measured to you in the same measure. So we need to be careful about judging one another. Verse 3 puts it into perspective for us. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? You know, i got to be honest with you. I never caught this until just this time studying. Jesus' earthly father, what was he? He was a carpenter. So this is something that Jesus would have experience with. How many of you have been uh, sawing boards before? right? And you see that sawdust fly. If you have contacts, it's a great thing. You know, it just gets right underneath that contact. <laughs> Lots of fun. You know, they didn't have the power saws back then. But if they are sawing, what happens if the wind goes? It can blow that same thing. 
You know, what happens when you get that in your eye, it's an irritation. But teens, you're going to love this. This is, I'm sorry, maybe you won't, but this is kind of gory. Did you ever think about this before? A speck and a plank in your own eye. I mean, picture this. We're talking about in a, a tool shop. They're cutting. Maybe the board hits the wrong way and right in the eye. Have you ever thought about how gross this illustration is? I mean, let's be real. A plank stuck in your eye. Just imagine it. It's, it's right there in your eye, okay? Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? So that speck represents an irritation. It's, it's a bother. You know, you don't want it in there. It's, it's annoying you. But let's be real. What is it like when you got a plank stuck in your eye? Yeah. You are impaired. You are potentially going to be blinded because of this. It's not just an irritation. So Jesus carries that the next step further and says, How can you say to your brother, Let me see the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? I mean, let's, let's be real and think about this. The guy has a plank in his eye, okay? Some kind of board in his eye. He's bleeding. And here Matthew is with the speck. Be still. I think I can get it. Caref- careful. Right? And Matthew is saying, what's up with you, man? Don't you realize you got a plank in your eye? Come on. What does Jesus say? You hypocrite. We've talked about the hypocrite a lot. This show. And I believe what Jesus is saying here is, You put on this big show of righteousness that you have your life all together, but that's not who you really are. And I know it. Who is he talking to? To his ambassadors, to his disciples, to the crowd. He's looking in the eyes of all those people that are beginning to, to pick up the nitpicky things and begin to pick one another. And he's saying, I see you. I know the sins that you struggle with. You've got this big issue in your life and you mean you're fighting and not fellowshipping with another brother because of this little thing? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye. See, the the fault is not in the judgment. You may be right. There is something that they need to work on. Maybe there is that piece of sawdust there that they need to work on. But the problem is your failure to deal with your own sin, your failure to apply it to you. I mean, isn't it, wouldn't it be odd for me to, to say to Matthew, man, you got to really deal with that sawdust. If, if that continues, that's going to be a problem for you. Your eyes may get red. And he's like, your eye is red, right? <laughs> really? First, take the plank out of your own eye then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So let's talk about this just for a minute. Why are we not to judge? From what we looked at the scripture, here's a few points. If you want to take notes on this, it's good. If not, it's okay. First of all, we will be judged, and sorry for missing the B there, we will be judged in a similar way to how we judge others. Secondly, We misread people because of our own sin. It's just like if I had that thing in my eye and I'm like, I think I can get the sawdust. You know, our sin blinds us. The things that we struggle with keeps us from really being able to help someone else with their sin. So we've got to deal with our own sin. We misread people because of our own sin. Also, we mistakenly feel it is our responsibility to carry out swift punishment against them. What does Jesus say? It is mine to avenge. I will repay. So it's not our responsibility to punish them. Also, here's the reason why we are not to judge. We demand them to do what we cannot. Right? Have you ever thought about that before? We... hold them to this level of expectation when all the while we're living right here. We have a tendency to put them down before others. And then lastly here, when it becomes self-serving 
or abusive, that's actually sin. Think about it. God's trying to get to the motive of our heart. Why are we judging someone? If it's genuinely because God has has asked us to do that, that's one thing. But if we're judging someone so that we can feel better about ourselves, we need to see what that is. It's pride, right? It's sin in our life, and we need to call it that. Here's your nice picture. You like this nice, cute dog? See, I had to find a picture like this because we love puppies, right? We love dogs. But not all dogs are nice. Not all dogs are man's best friend. Uh, In Israel at that time, you know, dogs, there were wild dogs around. And so what the picture you get is just imagine that you've got this nice piece of meat in your hand and you're giving it to this nice, cute dog. And he... Are you awake? Sorry. (laughs) And he grabs onto your hand and bites you. Here, you're trying to give him something that's good, and he goes and attacks you. Okay? This is the image that we get here. Don't give dogs what is sacred. Now, what in the world does this have to do with judging? Jesus is talking about the the nitpicky things that we we go over prejudging people and not dealing with our own sin. But there is going to come things that we do need to talk to somebody about. If they're struggling in an area, the loving thing is to talk to them about it. But there are some people that it's kind of dangerous to talk to them about it. I believe according to Scripture, we are to warn people. But if we see people trample on the truth that we give them, if we try to tell them about God and they beat us up afterwards, I don't think God is calling us to go back to that same individual that beat us up to tell the gospel. What did Jesus tell his disciples? If a town receives you, good. But if they don't, what are they supposed to do? Brush their feet off and go to the next town. And we talked about this when it comes to the loss that's out there. God loves them and we are to go to them. But I want to tell you, don't feel bad or feel guilty if someone does not receive and moving on to someone who will be receptive. Now, you listen to God, to what he would have you do. But keep this in mind. Jesus said, don't give to dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. And again, I couldn't put the cute pigs on. Babe is not on there or anything else. We have a wild boar here, three of them. So don't throw your pearl, something that's of great value. Here it's representing holy things of God to pigs. Now who can tell me how uh, in Israel pigs were viewed? Unclean, right? Okay, so don't give something that is holy and good to those people that are unclean. that are going to misuse this. If you do, they may trample them underneath their feet. Just imagine going, you've got a, a necklace that you paid uh, 300 or $400 for, and you go out into the pig pen and you put it on your nice pig. What's the first thing the pig does? <laughs> Shakes it off. Then he has a nice mud bath, rolls around, plays in the mud, and your, your precious uh, necklace is trampled in the mud. But it doesn't stop there. Before we get to the next part, let's think about this. Sometimes when we tell people about the things of God, they don't care. They, they trample it underfoot. But there's worse that can happen. They can trample them underfoot and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, I didn't know about this until I was an adult, that pigs can get vicious. Anybody have any experience with pigs being vicious? Yeah. I've heard that they can actually attack people. I don't know. I'm not a pig expert. You have to look at someone else. But I've heard uh, that they can be vicious. So both examples here, dogs and pigs, can be vicious and turn on those trying to help them. What is the point here? In your judging of other people, be careful not to nitpick over the little things and cause division. If you see a real need in someone, some area that they are wrong, you need to look, first of all, and see if they're going to receive that. If you have warned them, I don't believe God is calling you to get beat up in the process or to go over and over and over again to someone who is not going to be receptive. The last scripture I want to give you is uh, verse 12. 
And this should be governing everything that we've looked at so far. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Have any of you ever grown up or been in an environment where you have felt like everything you did was wrong? You know what that's like? Or maybe you've worked for a boss that was that way. Every single thing that you did. And what do you walk away feeling like in that moment? You, you feel worthless. You feel like there's nothing that I can do to change the situation. It's a miserable feeling being under the thumb of someone else. What do we learn from this? Do to others what you would have them do to you. When it comes to church, we've got to be careful not to put each other down. Uh, we don't want to be put down over little things. We want people to, to give us the benefit of the doubt. And so we should do the same thing for other people as well. Here's one scripture we're going to end on here. James chapter 1, verse 19. It says, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So when it comes time, when you see the sin of someone else, instead of jumping to in conclusions and working out their whole life of sin and treachery, why don't you stop and listen? If John is struggling with something, go up to John and say, John, how are you doing? What's going on in your life? Listen before you begin to share something. Be slow to speak. Before you challenge someone about an area of their life, think about it. How is this going to help them? What's your motivation? Is this to make you look better or is it to really help them? Is it out of love that you're saying this? And slow to become angry. Don't let that thing you see in others and you rise up in your righteous anger when all the while you have this big sin in your own life. Be slow to become angry. Would you stand with me for a moment?